Hi, I'm Steve Threadgold, the course coordinator of Soccer 1010, um, and this is the first uh, lecture content for that course. So hopefully by now you've um, had a look around the Canvas site, really looked into the course guide and understand all the requirements in the course, the assessment and how to study. Uh, the lectures aren't really going to talk about that aspect of what's in the course, we're just going to talk about content, talk about sociology, um, so please make sure that you look at the other stuff on Canvas to get your head around all that. This week I'm going to basically go over what sociology is and I'm going to do that in three parts. To begin with I'm just going to talk very broadly about what sociology is. In the second uh, video I'll um, introduce some more specific sociological themes and in the third video I'll introduce what we call the sociological imagination which by the end of the course we hope um, that you've been able to kind of somewhat, I suppose, bring into your own way of looking at the world. Okay, so let's start at the start. Part one, what is sociology? So, I suppose, um, before I start defining things, I'd like to talk a little bit about what sociology tries to do and, you know, what um, kind of orientation that we hope you have towards the world through this kind of sociological gaze. So a way of thinking about this is the um, uh, way of looking at the world that we can kind of talk about in terms of making the normal look strange. One of the key things in sociology that we'd like to um, introduce to you is a kind of questioning um, orientation towards many of the things that we take for granted, the way things are, traditions, things we don't tend to question too much. So I thought I'd start by using some memes and cartoons and things like that to do that. There's actually, um, in something like a meme, quite often that kind of making the normal look strange, almost sociological gaze happening. Um, making us look at something that maybe we've taken for granted, maybe that's absurd, and pointing out what's going on. So um, in you know, some, some of the ones that I've put in here to think about, um, and we'll look at some really kind of theories and concepts to think about these things more deeply throughout the course. You know, down one corner here we've got an example of, you know, a photo that appeared in the paper after the Allen Border Medal, a cricket um, awards ceremony, where the Australian puts in up the corner there David Warner standing in front, of, standing behind Elise Perry. Um, Warner appears taller in that um, photo, but um, the actual photo um, shown below it shows how much taller than Elise Perry is the David Warner there. You know, why? would um, someone putting that together feel the need to make the man look taller? taller? Um, what kind of gender disparities does this um, represent, or gender stereotypes? Um, if we look over there, there's the cartoon about um, Ghostbusters. Um, this kind of is in some ways making a comment of the, you know, the, the, the weird kind of man-baby controversies around there being a kind of actual, you know, female version of Ghostbusters a few years ago. Um, but, you know, what that is pointing out there is, like, when it comes to inequality, the female Ghostbusters are likely to be earning 80% of what the um, male ghost, Ghostbusters did. So, again, humour is something that's quite often um, used to kind of critically engage with the world in that sense. In the other corner there, we have a uh, kind of piecing together of the way that different people are, are treated by the legal system. So the top snippet shows a man that kind of committed $3 billion worth of fraud, gets a 40-month um, sentence. Below that is a story of a homeless man who um, stole something from a shop, um, felt guilty and took it back the next day, and then was sentenced to 15 years. And we can see very um, real disparities here between the way white-collar crime and blue-collar crime is um, treated by the legal system in the, in the US in that instance. In other ways of making the normal look strange, a sociological point of view will really get us to think about the way the economy works and the way it works for some people more than others, and the way that um, we're all encouraged to kind of participate in a, a labour force in one way or another that isn't necessarily always to our own advantage or our own well-being. So there's an upward credentialising of the workplace kind of meme there where this guy has a PhD, done three postdocs, published six papers, but can't get a job as, you know, um, the academic market is so precarious, more and more jobs mean more and more, need more and more qualifications. Um, and this is a real problem uh, across the across the global labour market. The one below that shows uh, 
um, very quickly highlights the ways that Australians tend to think that the coal industry is responsible for much more of our GDP and economic activity. Um, Australians believe coal mining makes up 12.5% of the economic output, but it's only 2.2 or whatever those stats point out there. So, again, um, this speaks to the way that very kind of powerful interests, conglomerates, media, politics, companies, can create a way of thinking about the world, of things that we take for granted, things that we think are true, that aren't real, real and uh, can be quite distortive. And these have effects on you know the way that people think about policies, inequalities, politics, and all that kind of thing. Touching upon that is the one in the top corner, and we can think about, you know, it relates back to the blue-collar, white-collar uh, thing in, in a little bit, is like, you know, that I'm consider as considering a career in organised crime, and he says government or private sector. Again, there's constantly stories every day, in, almost in the newspaper, about, you know, grant programs that 96% of the you know, funds went to the electorate of the government um, party in power. And um, what looks a lot like corruption, I would say, from a um, more objective point of view, just as kind of almost taken for granted practice in politics these days. On this page, we have some other issues that um, I think we'll cover throughout the course and look at some um, concepts to think about these more deeply. Um, Aspects of consumption, for instance, um, there's a lot of waste involved in the way things are produced. And the little cartoon down here talks about that, you know, I've only got to drink 14,000 more cups of coffee um, and cancel out the horrific conditions that um, the smartphone was manufactured. Um, free trade coffee, sorry. Um, the one up the top that kind of takes the piss out of Christmas, and the huge consumption around um, buying stuff that's, you know, almost always thrown out in a couple of months after Christmas. We'll look at institutions and the way that they are structures that affect our agency, uh, comment, uh, concepts that we'll look at throughout the course. Um, and there, there's a one basically comparing schools and prisons and, you know, from particular theoretical points of view, they do very similar roles um, in society. Um, the rise of social media, um, we'll do a whole week on digital media and um, this has kind of fundamentally revolutionised things like friendship Things like the um, separation between the private and public sphere um, and even the way that our own leisure practices and even our emotions now are data that are sold back to us in terms of advertising. We'll see, see we'll look at also the different forms of deviance and what's seen normal and strange, who has power to kind of decide those things. And the, um, the photo up the top corner there um, asks us to think about, you know, when something is reported as a riot, as a riot, sorry, you know, who seems to be the ones that came dressed to be the ones to have a riot? Um, and, you know, uh, is it actually the people protesting that often um, are the ones that uh, spark the violence? We'll even think about, you know, concepts of time, the way time is quite socially constructed in the way that we have relations with it. Time is really something that uh, draws out emotions, you know. Um, it can put us under pressure. Um, we separate between work time and leisure time and family time and... Um, in sociology, there's different concepts of time from um, clock time that was introduced around the rise of the factory to kind of more evolutionary time over eons um, and theories today that think about how time and space have been compressed by the rise of the internet. So the meme down there kind of talks about how, you know, people running around in the morning um, doing their exercise in some situations could be funny, confronted by, you know, drunk people leaving a nightclub and you know, their concept of time at that point would be uh, quite confrontational. So here we're trying to, I'm just trying to spark in you a way of thinking about making the normal look strange. And, um, you know, memes and comedy and stuff like that is one way um, that this happens in the everyday. Um, and sociology is a way of kind of orienting our thoughts critically towards what we take for granted um, and who benefits from those situations. So... Um, more formally, what is sociology? So it means different things to different people. It's a really kind of large, disparate um, discipline. There's lots of points of view, views in it. Um, it's not necessarily, necessarily politically left or right, although um, its orientation is different in different countries and from different traditions. But very broadly, sociology uses a combination of research, 
theory and criticism. I'll talk about more in a minute. Sociology uses empirical research to make its points and to, um, to have impact in the world. So it's a, in that sense, it's a scientific study. Um, you know, so some people will do you know, large-scale um, quantitative statistics, you know, surveys and stuff like that. Others do interviews about things or observations in workplaces, um, participatory research where the researcher may take part in the thing that they're researching or get um, their research participants to create things to express um, the thing that they're researching. So importantly, thing to remember here is that what sociology tries to do is a scientific study of the world to um, observe how things function, how societies work or not, what could be more efficient, less efficient, what could be more fair and equal, um, and the distribution of inequality and power are particularly important objects of study in sociology that we'll talk about at length throughout the course. In a minute, I'll look at the relationship that's important to think about here in terms of agency and structure, the relations of an individual in the world and the social systems that kind of influence the things they can and can't do, the things that are right and wrong, the things that are legal or illegal, the things that make us cool and uncool or smart and dumb. Sociologists are also, also are therefore, when it relates to institutions and structures, you know, how things stay the same, who benefits from the current way things are, the status quo, but also we're really interested in how things can change, particularly um, how things can maybe be, you know, made better. So in just, you know, very probably over generalizing comparisons to other disciplines, you know, sociology tends to study the groups and relations between them, not so much kind of individual psychologies. Um, unlike philosophy or journalism, we require evidence, not just argument or not just opinion. Um, and that's really important for you to think about in your tutorials and in your essays. Um, as I've said at length already, we attempt to question notions of common sense and question the legitimacy of how power works. And I'll talk about power as a concept in the second uh, uh, video. We try and make the normal look strange, try and look for the normal in the strange and the strange in the normal and think about how all kind of disparate things interrelate. And by that I mean, you know, how, you know, a global pandemic can affect, you know, your day-to-day -day life, or how the invention of the mobile phone can change the way that we relate to each other. Um, how a change in policy or funding arrangements can have real effects on people's, you know, um, opportunities and life chances. So, you know, normally in the first kind of lecture of explaining what a discipline is, we have these kind of very, um, you know, straightforward definitions. Very broadly, sociology is the study of society. I suppose it's the most pithy definition. Um, web of humans, interactions and relationships. Objective study of human behaviour insofar as it is affected by the fact that people live in groups. Whether it's objective or not is, I suppose, a debate that happens actually within sociology. And again, I'll talk about that in a sec. Sociology is the study of individuals in social settings. Sociologists study interrelations between um, interrelationships between individuals, organisations, cultures, and societies. Sociology is a study of individuals in groups in a systematic way. You kind of get the picture here. So you know, very broadly, sociology wants to study the way that societies function, the way that individuals and institutions and structures relate to each other, um, who benefits from those situations, how can things change. A more controversial way of thinking about what sociology is, is from the French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu, who will be quite prominent throughout the course and is um, very important to my own uh, research. Um, so while some argue that sociology needs to be an apolitical scientific endeavour, where the kind of personal opinion is never really present in the research, others argue that that's pretty much impossible. I mean, the very choice of what your research often reflects your own interests, your own experience, the things that you see is important. So um, this speaks very closely, I suppose, to my introduction to sociology. I came to university wanting to actually be a kind of music or sports journalist and discovered sociology and kind of have never left. Um, and the thing that really enamored me to sociology was um, research about kind of inequalities in schools and really spoke to my own kind of experience of those things about, you know, why we're all mucking up and making sure no one else could do work or whatever. And um, Paul Willis's book, Learning to Labour, really kind of opened my eyes to that kind of stuff. So my interest in inequalities and class and the life chances of young people 
um, you know, in some ways relates to my own life and experiences and observations. The idea that I can then somehow, you know, remove myself from what I study as if I'm looking at something in a test tube um, doesn't really make a lot of actual practical sense. So it's quite common today for sociologists to understand their own biases, a part of the research process, and to try and actually, you know, separate those out in terms of the choices you make, but also be, I suppose, um, understanding of how it's kind of inevitable and um, therefore the choices we make in research processes are quite political in that sense. For Bourdieu, this is kind of inevitable, and he therefore argues that what sociology is best suited to do is kind of a, a research endeavour to defend um, those who can't defend themselves. Um, um, metaphorically, he kind of argues sociology is therefore a martial art. Used for defence, not attack, sociologists should work from a humanistic standpoint and help defend the defenceless, always questioning the workings of power, attempt to make life better for everyone, asking hard questions and uh, uh, kind of um, pithy kind of saying that comes up all the time is, you know, speaking truth to power. From this point of view, sociology's role, and this is very much speaks to the critical um, tradition of sociology that you'll hear more about over the coming weeks, is to discover and uncover hidden, symbolic, taken for granted assumptions that underpin power relations and advantage some people over others. So, by the end of the course, um, we will hope that you'll be thinking sociologically. Um, here we're hoping to instill a more kind of sensitive and tolerant um, understanding of diversity, think about the world um, through other people's eyes, um, you know, be open to kind of new things, new horizons, um, and I suppose try and instill some kind of empathy and understanding for those that may be below you in the social system. Um, and this is particularly important for those, you know, working in um, or, or studying to move into the professions, whether that's, you know, teaching, law, social work, all these things where you'll be interacting with other humans, um, thinking sociologically can actually be really helpful um, in the everyday kind of micro relations um, that you have in those fields. So what we want to instill by the end of the course is what we call a sociological gaze, a way of looking at the world around us, looking for the links between individual experience and the social context in which we all work, live and play. And so as um, I kind of pointed out, this was kind of, you know, uh, profoundly changed um, the way that I kind of viewed myself and the world, and this is quite common for people in sociology. It can actually be quite confronting for people as well in many ways. Um, but I think it's important that the gaze asks us to embrace those kind of things and think about what they mean and orient ourselves, orient ourselves towards the world to, you know, hopefully um, make it better in that sense. So in terms of that sociological gaze, what does that mean? We want to think about how all kind of disparate things interrelate. So seeing the general in the particular is really important. So, you know, what that means, we're all individuals, you know, we're all kind of coming to the world as individuals in a sense. We're born, but like we're born into a family. That family will have a particular background, you know, mum and dad will have particular careers or work backgrounds, you know, and they'll be particular ethnicity or live in a particular area. So therefore, you know, we're all, while we're born as individuals, we're kind of also born into certain categories and stereotypes and groups. And these things, you know, affect our life chances. People that share these kind of things, share similar experiences and often share similar life chances and we'll be looking at those homologies throughout the course. I spoke already about seeing the familiar and the strange, um, learning about how society affects us in ways that we probably wouldn't have imagined, really learning to kind of critically engage what we often see as common sense and taken for granted preferences, both um, in, out in the world, things that others take for granted, but like hopefully in the course, some of the things that you take for granted as well. We'd also like you to see society in our everyday ch choices. So our personal decisions are shaped by society. And so, you know, you can think about this, in, I suppose, in your, term, in your own taste, your own morals, your own values. Um, you know, while we all have our own choices and tastes, we might like footy and, you know, like Nike and, you know, listen to... Um, uh, hip-hop or, or whatever, and we feel these are our personal choices, 
as a lot of sociological research shows, these tastes and values and things that we want to buy and things that we like and hate aren't necessarily all that individual. And sometimes um, people's tastes and values and morals are quite predictable, again, ba based back towards relating to those similar, similar shared experiences. The other thing that's a kind of particular aspect of the sociological gaze is seeing society in marginality and crisis. So when kind of big things happen in the world, um, you know, a lot of the underlying unequal relations, the underlying problems um, are really brought out and um, become quite obvious. So the pandemic is certainly a good example of that. And we'll probably, probably use the pandemic as an example throughout the course, I suppose. Um, you know, and when natural disasters happen or when there's wars and all these kind of things, these crises are particular ways of thinking about that relationship between agency and structure. Um, and who gets to kind of be safe, who gets to live, um, who gets to, you know, be the people that are on the end of the attack in the war or the ones that are enforcing it. Overall, by the end of the course, we hope that the 12 weeks that we do will help you instill a sociological gaze and get you to think a little bit more critically about the world and your place in it. I'll leave that there for this video, and in the second video, I'll be looking more specifically at sociological themes.